All right. Howdy, everybody. So, uh, yeah, uh, so a couple of weeks ago, we went through when we talked about DNS Cat 2, and that seemed to go really well. So we wanted to kind of do a follow up on that. Brought to you by Black Hills and ACM. You know, we're, we're you know, brother sister companies. It, this works out really awesome because uh, Black Hills really, really good at red teaming, really good at breaking in. And we make a tool to try and catch folks like that. So they're constantly trying to sneak past our stuff, which gives us the ability to kind of, you know, pivot and do modifications before anything hits the wild, which is just, it's fun. People should not get paid for this. And yet, uh, so like I said, we did DNS cat a couple of weeks ago. There's a lot of interest in that. Wanted to do another one. GCAT's one of my personal favorites. Uh, so I wanted to go through on this one and go through and dissect it. I noticed a couple of ideas come through in questions. That's awesome. We'll go through and kind of parse those afterwards. But if you've got any other ideas for command and control channels you want to go through, like Cobalt Strike or, you know, whatever, there's quite a few out there. Uh, I'm more than happy to go through and kind of work through a decode. Just drop us a tweet and we'll kind of take it from there. So this is going to be a deep dive on GCAT. There's a couple of things about GCAT that makes it really interesting to me. One is that it's brain dead simple. GCAT it, for all intents and purposes, is an email client. It's pretty simplistic. It's an email client built on Python. So it's very simplistic. It's hard to catch in that it does a really good job of matching normal traffic patterns, more so than most other tools. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, where are you going to have problems? Where might you be able to grab this? The other reason I wanted to talk about it is because, oh my God, way too many vendors ignore this. We've seen a lot of folks in this space where be, they, they're, look, they're trying to detect beacons based on timing only. They're not looking at anything like session size or number of packets or that type of thing. They're looking at timing only. They're looking at very brief periods of time, like two minutes or less. So when you get into that, and I'll show you why, it's really hard to distinguish this from, from just a regular normal email client. So since they can't tell the difference, they say, screw it, just ignore it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you get whacked and this is the covert communication channel, they're not even collecting the data you need for after the fact forensics if you figure out this is what's going on. The content I'm going to go through today, we're going to make all of this available to everybody. So the uh, I'm actually going to be working with bro logs as opposed to PCAPs this week. So we'll make all those bro logs available. The slides will be available. Um, I've got all my commands on the slides. So if anybody wants to kind of walk through this process after the fact, uh, we're going to give you everything you need to be able to go through and do this. So like I said, command and control channel built on, built on Python. What this does is it reaches out to Gmail via IMAP4 over TLS or, or protected with TLS, and it uses that as its kind of call home channel. It then goes through and uses SMT anytime, SMTP anytime it needs to send back some sort of a response. So it, it's, again, it's not really that different from like a user that might be going in and checking mail. Well, this makes it really hard to deal with. You know, I've got my internal system here and it's just going out checking mail on a Gmail server. Now we're, we're, I'm calling out Gmail and I'm calling out Gmail because GCAT, not surprisingly, is designed to work with Gmail, specifically uh, at gmail.com addresses. But this can work with Yahoo, this can work with Office 365, this can work with, you know, just about any mail client you can, or a mail server, a mail service you can think of, including private servers. So if you're thinking, well, I'll just block all email to Gmail and that'll take care of the problem. Okay, that'll take care of GCAP, but it wouldn't take, if you take a look at the code, it doesn't take much to modify this to have this work with a different server. If you think, okay, I'll block IMAP, yeah, okay, that'll take care of GCAP, but it wouldn't take much to convert this over to, you know, POP3 or HTTPS or, you know, something else instead. So we want to make sure that if somebody creates a variant, whatever process we do to catch this are going to catch the variants as well. You know, we don't want to always be playing catch up type of thing. So as I said, we can go through and we can, you know, block what we know this uses. And a lot of this comes down to policy. You know, for some companies, they go through and they say, yeah, we're not going to let you use private email. So we're going to block, you know, we're going to block IMAP4. We're not using it internally. You get no reason to use it, so we'll just block it. And if you can do that, yeah, that helps. That, that removes, it doesn't, again, it doesn't fix this because someone could change and use Office 365 or Yahoo or something else instead. It does reduce your attack surface if you can go through and you can go down that road. So locking it down, definitely helpful. 
But when you start going down the rabbit hole of what could somebody come up with for variance off of GCAT and how do I block that, trying to handle it in a reactive format is really difficult. And this is why it's hard to detect. So what you're looking at here is, this is actually one of the graphs from AI Hunter. We're looking at a time graph here. So on the right-hand side, the x-axis is time. So this is number of seconds. My y-axis is quantity. So we're looking at a 24-hour period of time, and we're looking at groupings of timings. How often did this thing go off at 10 seconds? How often did it go off at 12 seconds? You know, it was how often was there a 10-second gap between each session? How many was it 12? Was there a 14? And so on. 10 seconds is probably where our major peak is here. Again, this is how a regular email client works. So with a lot of beacons, you know, like DNS cat that we, we covered last time, you can go in and you can analyze that from a timing perspective. And, you know, things usually don't beacon over DNS. So you can go in and analyze timing over DNS and pull out DNS cat or a variant any, any given time. Because again, that's not normal for that protocol. But here we're looking at something a little different. We're looking at an email client checking in, checking for mail that is designed to happen in a you know very programmatic fashion. It's, hap- it's designed to actually happen every 10 to 15 seconds, whatever the case may be. So again, email client u- used by a user, email client being used by a backdoor, they're gonna have the same timing. You can't look at the timing between sessions to distinguish between the two. That, that's really the big thing to kind of pull out of this graph. So let's work with D- Zeke. Last time I was working with some raw PCAPs. I want to kind of mix it up on occasion just to make sure we got good coverage, of some, uh, some awesome open source tools. And Zeke is a very much an awesome open source tool. Um, Zeke goes through, grabs packets as they go by on the wire. It doesn't do a full packet capture. You know, it's not a PCAP. It's going in, stripping out. For the most part, it's stripping out header information. You can extract files if you want to. Um, it does give you the application layer as well. But what I love about Zeek is that from a security person's perspective, when you think about what's interesting in a packet and what might I want to keep track of, it does a pretty good job of grabbing all that stuff. So it writes things out to a number of different logs based on you know, what it's looking at. So like there's an HTTP log, which has, hey, you guessed it, HTTP traffic in there. There's a SSL log that goes through and records your SSL TLS negotiations. You, know, you can see digital certificates. The one in particular we're looking at here is the con log. So this is keeping track of information regarding connections between systems. Quick rundown of what some of this output is. The first thing we have is an absolute timestamp. And you can see we get some pretty good fidelity here. There's a unique ID number for this particular session. We see source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, transport, the application layer if it's recognized. So bro, excuse me, Zeke, I'm gonna keep doing that, sorry. It's been bro for so long. Zeke does not go through and just say, oh, it went to port 53, it must be DNS. Zeke says, hey, I need to see a DNS header in there to actually label this as DNS, which is cool. Because if you've got somebody tunneling things over a port that you don't expect, uh, you're gonna be able to tell the difference between those two. Um, And then we get a lot of other fields in here that kind of identify our absolute timing, how many packets went back and forth, was this initiated internally versus externally. We got some really good data to go through and parse in order to be able to figure out what's going on with our connections. So here's where I started. I went in and I just said Zcat because these things are compressed by default. You know, Bro will go through and compress its data to try and reduce the amount of storage it's taking up. I go through and I use Zcat and I just say, list out everything in every single con log. So the con logs are con.00, con.01, con.02, and so on up from there over a 24 hour period of time. So I'm grabbing every connection that took place on 216, 2018, and I'm just extracting that out. And rather than just printing it out to the screen, I'm pumping it through another tool, which if you're not familiar with, oh my God, you gotta play with this thing, BroCut. BroCut just makes life so much easier. A lot of us are really good at using like Auk and Sad and Perl to go through and cut out different fields that we're interested in. BroCut is actually Bro aware. So you can go in and you can define the Bro field that you actually want to see and it will go through and print that out. So that's what I did here. So after BroCut, you can see the next thing I specify is TS. TS is short for timestamp. So that's that absolute timestamp you see at the bottom. ID.orig.r, excuse me, underscore H, that's the source IP address. 
I don't think I need to read the rest of those. You can kind of figure them out from there, the response port, the result, response host, and so on. But then I'm piping it through grep and I'm looking for one specific IP. So when we go through and we do an analysis looking for beacons, what we want to do is work with IP pairs. We want to say, okay, for this internal system, let me go through every IP address it talked to and let me look for signs of beacon-like activity. Now, there's some stuff you can do to kind of minimize that so that you're not looking at everything. You can look at, you know, was there less than 20 sessions in the day? If there was less than 20 connections made in the course of a day, it's probably not going to be a beacon. It could be somebody who's going really slow, you know, where they're only beaconing twice a day. But quite honestly, you're not going to catch it, which is two data points in a day anyway. So I usually go through and say, yeah, anything less than 20 connections, just get rid of it. And that actually cleans out a lot of cruff, makes it a whole lot easier. But we're focusing on one, one specific internal IP address talking to one external IP address. So that's the reason for the grep command. And then I'm dumping it through TR. So uh, Zeke goes through and gives you this tab separated format, which is kind of a pain to go through and work with and manipulate. What TR allows me to do is it allows me to just go in and do a quick replacement. So I'm saying replace all tabs with commas, and now you see, and I get the output that you see down at the bottom here. So now I've got everything in comma separated format. It's a whole lot easier to go in and work with. My last three, my last four columns, I've got TCP, so that's my protocol. 993, that's the port that we're seeing it communicating to on the system out on the internet. 991 is the number of bytes that my internal system sent to the host on the internet. 4193 is the number of bytes that that host sent in response back to my internal host. So I've, I, it breaks out bytes in each direction, which is kind of nice too. And we'll, we'll play more with that in just a second. So I got a couple of options here. One is I could try and force the, hey, I really want to do a time analysis between them. And, in, in, and if we're looking specifically for, GC, uh, for GCAT, we, I already mentioned it's a waste of time because you're not going to be able to tell the difference between that and a regular client. So we're not gonna, I'm not going to go down that road in this presentation. I'm going to give you one slide that you know, kind of talks through how to solve that, but we're not going to use that here. So we can do time analysis. And like I said, that's the popular way to go through and find beacons. But hey, when do we ever want to do things the popular way, right? You know, what are some of the other possibilities we can work with? Well, we just noticed that we see the number of bytes going back and forth. That's something we can look for in consistency. If we're seeing our internal host is very consistently sending the exact same number of bytes in every session in this many, many sessions over the course of a day, that could be a beacon. If the response back is consistent, that might be a beacon. If the number of packets going one way or the other is consistent, that might be a beacon. So we have a couple of things we can clue in on here to try and figure out is this, uh, is this GCAT or not. And I'll come back into those as we go through. I did want to note that you know if we want to see delta time, if we're working with some of the other bro logs, like uh, packet loss, I know is one of the ones, it supports a field named TS underscore delta. It'll actually print out time deltas. But for the con log specifically, uh, you can only print out the absolute timestamp. So if you want the delta, you need to figure out some way to calculate this yourself versus actually you know, letting the tool do it for you. And here's one possible option, throw it in a spreadsheet. You know, and here I just got a simple formula saying, hey, let's subtract the timestamps so I can go through and figure out my deltas. And if you look here, you can see, yeah, we're kind of bouncing back and forth between, you know, a little over 10 and a half seconds up to about 12 seconds, just in the little bit snippets of data we're seeing here. And, you know, again, I could do the analysis on time, but again, user, backdoor, timing's going to be the same, not worth going down this road. There's a couple of ways you can do this on the command line as well with Python and a couple of other tools. I'll leave you to kind of go through and kind of tease that one out. Okay. So can't use timing, so we're going to go in, we're going to focus on number of packets and number of bytes that are going back and forth. I've added in a couple of fields here, as you can see. So that's the, the top circle identifies the additional fields I've added into my, uh, to my bro cut output. And the bottom circle is just showing you, hey, here's an example of that output. Here's what we're getting out of this whole thing. So same command as before, I just you know, pulled a couple of additional fields into this whole thing. Now, I want to go through and do an analysis. So basically what I end up with, as you see here, is I end up with a column bun with a bunch of numbers. So if I look at that second to last column, 991, that's the number of bytes that was sent from the internal system to the host on the internet. So I want to look at a couple of things. The first thing I want to look at is how many sessions took place in the course of a day. 
Because again, if it's like 20 or less, you eh, probably don't care about that. I may also want to start breaking these out based on time interval. I may want to go in and say, okay, for every hour, how many were sent? So, it, you know, if this is going off every 10 seconds, I should be seeing about six of these a minute. Okay, that's about 300 and, you know, 60 of these every hour. Am I seeing consistently 360 sessions taking place per hour? If so, yeah, okay, that's probably a beacon. That's something I need to go in and take a look at. So if I want to do a time analysis, you know, I can do it based on the entire 24-hour block. I can break it out into smaller sessions. I can also go in and I can look at it statistically. I can do the same thing with number of packets. I can do the same thing with my byte sizes. So we've got 991 bytes here being sent from my internal system to this host on the internet. Let's say I go through and I look and I see, yeah, it transmitted 20,000 times yesterday. Okay. How often was 991 used? Because if there was 20,000 sessions established from the internal system to that external system, and let's say 98% of them or more are, were 991 bytes exactly, guess what? That's a beacon. That's something we need to go in and you know, further analyze. Same thing for the bytes in return, although we can see that's changing up a couple of bytes here and there. Same thing for the number of packets, which we can see are fairly consistent, but you know it's plus or minus a packet here or there. That's going to happen. So again, we can break it out into little timing buckets and analyze it that way. Or what I did here was I just said, okay, let me take the whole 24-hour block, and I'm going to go through, I'm going to run this through our script. If you're not familiar with our script, one of the problems we've had in kind of the scientific field is repeatability of data, meaning that I go off and do a study. So I, you know, look at how, you know, mice react when they're forced to watch, you know, DC based movies. And, you know, and I go through and I collect up my data based around that, you know, and then someone wants to try and reproduce my results. Well, it's kind of obvious that they would need to, you know, take the mice, force their eyes open and make them watch a really bad Batman movie. But the, the way I go through and calculate the data actually pays, plays a big part in what I come up with for answers. And believe it or not, that was something that hasn't, wasn't standardized for the longest time. It kind of came down to which software package did you use? Because every software package looked at things like you know, means and standard deviations differently. Well, that's where our script came from. Our script is just a standard way to go through and do this analysis. So if I do this and you do this, we will always come up with exactly the same numbers. So what I went through and did here is I ran our script. And I said, all right, I want to go through and I want to cut field five. So cut uh, field five is, if we count over, that is the uh, number of packets that I'm sending off to the remote system. And I went through and said, okay, show me the minimum. Okay, the minimum was one. So we had at least one session where one packet went by. What's the maximum? It's 18. What's the mean? What's my average? Okay, that was about 13.3 or around 13 to 14, which again, if we look at the beginning of the data, we see a bunch of 13s, we see 114 in there, that's my average. And then we have my, our standard deviation. And for the purposes of trying to tag beacons, the standard deviation is the one that we want to play, uh, pay the most attention to. Small numbers indicates a beacon. Large numbers indicates probably not a beacon. So what we're saying here is that if my mean or my average is 13.3 and my standard deviation is about 0.5, okay, I'm running about plus or minus 0.5 around 13.3. That's a pretty tight window. So from looking at the number of packets leaving as part of each session, it's looking to me like it's a beacon. The bottom of the screen, we're doing exactly the same thing, but with the number of packets coming back in return. And again, it's about a 0.5 standard deviation. That's pretty small. So again, we're looking at something that looks like it might be a beacon. Now I go in and we're doing this again, only this time with session size. So remember our last two columns are number of bytes sent, number of bytes received. So we're going through and doing an analysis based on that. We've got a zero in there. So we had, my guess is we probably at some point got a reset packet or we got something that got transmitted that just you know wasn't processed on the other side we got a zero packet as a response. So yeah, we probably got a reset in there for some place. So maybe a system got busy, maybe you know something went south, but we've got a session with no data in it that took place. We'd want to go through and kind of dig into that one a little bit. If we look at our standard deviation, that is a larger number, but we're also, if you look at your average, the average number is also a whole lot bigger. 
So we're still varying around a very small point. Um, the, the deviation off of both of these is about the same. You know, we've got an 11.8 uh, up top, 51.7 down the bottom, but my bottom number is about four times bigger than my top number, which is, you know, four times 11. Yeah, it's going to get me up around close to 50. So, you know, you get the idea. The deviation is about the same on both of these. You're going to get that most of the time. Um, however, some of these things, some of these back doors are actually asynchronous. So you might actually see differences on occasion, and that's something that's worth taking in on. Again, it's always good to kind of keep an idea on what is the protocol I'm looking at. You know, here we're analyzing IMAP4. Is, is IMAP4 asynchronous? Do I expect to see a ton of packets going one way and not so much the other? No, I really don't. Okay, so now if I ever see that type of activity, that tells me something suspicious is going on. I need to go in and pay attention to that. But this is showing me that from a data size perspective, I'm seeing some pretty solid consistency here. It's not flat solid. So not every session is exactly the same, but it's close enough from my standard deviation to tell me, yeah, I'm probably looking at a beacon here. And because there's some variation here, it's a beacon that may have been activated over this data set. Okay, so that's using just standard R script tools, command line stuff. What if I want to step this up a little bit and make it a little bit easier? Well, you could use Rita for that. Rita is our open source tool that allows you to go through, and it's specifically designed to go in and look at beacons. Looks at timing, looks at size, you know, and makes a determination based on that as to whether, yeah, is this a beacon, yes or no. And if I look at my reader output, my very first column, will you see that circle? That is our score, if you will, of the beacon-like act uh, of how beacon-like the connection was between that internal IP address 1055.100.11 and that external IP we've been looking at 108, 177, 112, 108. We're calling it 0.874, which is about an 87%. So we're saying 87. We're 87% certain this is a beacon, meaning that yeah, there's, there's some timing and uh, there's some variation in the timing and the packet size that we're looking at that we're saying. We're not 100% certain it's a beacon, but it's pretty close. Now, I'll be honest with you. Usually, at 90 and above is actionable, meaning that the way we, we kind of maintain Rita is we want Rita to identify something as 0.9 or higher if it's something that you really need to make sure you go in and pay attention to. And as you can see here, it's just below that threshold. It's 0.874. Again, GCAT, really hard to catch. So even tools that are designed specifically to go after command and control can kind of struggle with this thing on occasion. So this is up high enough that, yeah, you would notice it, you'd see it, you may go in and take a look at it, but it's still not quite hitting the point 90 that we want. We've actually got some changes in the tool that we've got in the queue to uh, go through and kind of help resolve this. Uh, real quick, I just, I'm throwing the link to Rita in the chat for those, and then we'll make it available in the recording if, uh, if people want to click in the description. So yep, it's, it's also going to be on my last slide where you can download Rita from. Awesome. I got a link to our GitHub for that. Cool. So yeah, just so again, just as a reminder why this is hard, it looks just like an email client. So this is, uh, again, another plot out of AI Hunter. This is connectivity between these two IP addresses over a 24-hour period of time. This could be a user, end user. This could be uh, a backdoor. It really... You know, regardless of which one you're looking at, it's going to be hard to tell. So I've been giving you a lot of, gee, this is hard, gee, this is hard, gee, this is hard, gee, this is hard. Come on, Chris, give us something we can actually work with here. There are some distinct differences between how email works and how a backdoor works that you can actually go in and try and key in on. One is look at the number of data sessions that match the heartbeat versus have some additional amount of data in them. So what are we looking at here? Again, we're looking at another A Hunter graph. What this, this big peak on the left, what that's telling us is a majority of the time, so I'm gonna call that around 7,600 times, it went in and it checked and the session was that size. You know, I'm gonna call that around 3K, 3,000K, somewhere in that range there. That's indicative of a heartbeat. That's indicative of, you know, checking in and saying, hey, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. But it could also be, hey, do you have any email for me? No, I don't. You know, there's no email to send. What we're looking at here is actually an end user system. And what makes this look like an end user system is the number of peaks that you're seeing along the bottom here. 
The average end user sends and receives about 130 emails per day. So with that in mind, I would expect to see about 100 plus little peaks along the bottom here showing me that some different session size besides that no, there's no mail for you is actually being used. Now, there is a false positive for this. You know, you could have an end user that just never receives or sends email. Nobody likes them. No one wants to send them anything. They don't want to talk to anyone themselves. They're a hermit. So, you know, you could end up in a situation where for that user, all you have is this peak and that's it. And that could happen. But for most users, you're going to get data kind of similar to this. Sometimes you'll get more peaks out here. You know, it really depends. But the, the real key is that one of the th what we're showing is the size of the session. That session size changes every time you like add a word or add punctuation or add anything to a message. So a one sentence email versus a two sentence email, that's going to be two different message sizes. If attachments are there, that's going to be a different size. If there's a couple of paragraphs there, that'll be a different size. So we're saying 130 emails per day, but all 130 of those on average are going to have a unique size to them. So I'm going to have some large number of points. So I wanted to give you this as a baseline. So when we look at this from a size perspective, what should email look like? Email should look like this. I'll see some number of, nope, there was no mail, but I'm going to see some number around 130 or so of, yes, there was mail and there's a bunch of different message sizes here to work with. Okay, now let's compare that to this. What's odd here? Well, the odd here is, <laughs> We only have our, you know, calling home, hey, is there any email for me? Now, again, this could be that hermit user. That could be someone who never gets mail. Or more likely, this is a backdoor that hasn't been activated yet. It's very rare to have an email account that is constantly being checked that never receives mail. You know, I might set up an email account that I use very rarely. You know, I might use it to like subscribe to a couple of things and that's it. But if it's not an active account, I'm certainly not going to sit on it 24 hours a day, right? That, that, that's almost kind of sad if you think about it. If I was like checking mail constantly, knowing I will never get mail and, you know, let's break out the little tiny violins. So for accounts that tend not to get used usually don't fall into that category being monitored all day long. This one is, you know, we've got 24 hours worth of data that we were looking at. So something or someone is monitoring this account in the hopes that there's something there and there never is, it's probably not going to be an end user. Now, there's a variation off of this. Notice what I have here. I have that same heartbeat, but I've got three additional data points I'm showing along the bottom. Gee, what are, I wonder what that is. <laughs> that tells me that three times over this 24-hour period of time, this back door was activated. Now, again, if there was 100 plus, yeah, this might fall under the radar. You know, so if you're listening to this and you're trying to figure out how to use Gmail and how to like avoid everybody from being able to detect you, yeah, just make sure you activate it at least 100 plus times a day. And now you're going to look more like an end user. You know, that, that would make it fall into the noise. But until that happens, this gives us some method of being able to go in and detect this or more importantly, variations off of this, meaning that if someone says, oh, OK, everybody's looking to this going to Gmail. So I'm going to use Office 365 instead, or I'm going to use Yahoo instead. This will still work. This process will still work because we're looking at the, the behavior of the communication protocol itself. So email versus GCAT, like I said, similar timing for both of these. It's the session size that really allows us to call this out. And, you know, as we saw, packets, uh, number of packets can be used as part of this. Again, a lot of attention is paid to try and tag beacons based on timing. People kind of immediately fall to that as well. But if you kind of stop and think about, you know, what characteristics do I have to work with? Quantity of packets, quantity of data being transferred as part of each session. Those are things we can go in and we can try and key in on for consistency as well. That's something I can also go in and try and leverage. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned that some back doors you can't go after using timing. Some of them are really good at hiding their tracks. DNS cat, you know, we looked at that one uh, last time. And DNS cat, we talked about can use text, it can use MX, and it can use C names as part of the covert communication channels. But those are not the only tools out there that are communicating over DNS. 
We've had customers for AI Hunter come back to us and say, hey, so we've just caught this new DNS backdoor variant and it's doing this. One of the ones we saw, I so I have two personal favorites and I have two personal favorites from a, well, that's neat. And I hope never use, somebody never uses it against me perspective. One of them was quad A queries. The command and control channel was actually encoded in the 128 bits coming back. And the way they tagged that was we're going in and again, we're looking at how should DNS be working versus how it's not. And I can kind of walk folks this, through this in a demo. If you want a demo, you just type demo into questions and we'll kind of run with it from there. Um, I can give you a deep dive on how this works. But you know, we went in and we identified, hey, this domain here is odd. This is something you need to take a closer look at. And when they looked at what type of traffic was involved, it was quad A queries. Okay. So they saw a bunch of IP, uh, IPv6 addresses coming back. And the first thing that caught their attention was they were for different subnets. When you think about IPv4, it's not uncommon for a company to have IP addresses that are out of different ranges. Like, hey, you know, 10 years ago, I got my 202 dot something address. And now it here is it's 10 years later and I need a couple more addresses. So somebody's going to give me an eight dot something address. So, you know, I might have IP addresses that are all part of my network, but are out of completely different ranges. Well, one of the benefits of IP6 is, oh my God, I hope we never run into that problem again. Everything's supposed to be hierarchical. So you're supposed to be able to get a block of addresses that are huge, that you'll never run through all of them, that you can just go through and use. So they were seeing IPs out of different ranges, and it was odd that a host was being queried within a domain and all these different IPv6 ranges was coming up. So that was the first thing that kind of caught their attention. The second thing that caught their attention was with that when they started doing a reverse lookup on these IPv6 addresses, they were finding out they hadn't been allocated to anybody yet. Well, wait a minute. Why is my system querying an IPv6 address that hasn't even been allocated yet? This makes no sense. Yeah, it turns out that was a command and control channel. The other one we saw, uh, the other one we've seen out of a customer, um, and I thought this was really creative, was using DKIM. Uh, so with DKIM, I can go in and I can say, I want to validate that, that remote name server is actually authoritative for this domain. So I want to grab a copy of the public key so that I can go through and use that to check the signature and validate that that private key you know, issued and signed this so I know it's all valid. Think digital certificates on a web server and you know, it's basically the same thing over DNS. Well, what was coming through was an invalid public key. And when they dug into it a little bit further, it was obfuscated command and control channel. So they were using DKIM, a tool we created for good to make DNS more secure, and they were leveraging it to make DNS less secure by making it a covert communication channel. So, you know, I think the irony is kind of funny, but that's another one where I say, you know, I just never want to see that being used against me. But again, those were all ones you can kind of pull out from a timing perspective. But session size, yeah, sometimes you got to fall back on that. We saw that today with GCAT. Our timing was the same between our end with, between our end user software and the command and control channel. Our only option is to go in and try and hit it based on uh, based on size. So you know, understand that normal versus what you're actually looking at. That makes a big difference. And like I said, if you want to see more covered, hit us up on Twitter. You know, drop us a note. Hey, this is what we're interested in seeing. You know, we're happy to go through and cover them. We've got a pretty good archive of PCAPs on different command and control channels just as part of the testing we do. So we've always got something we can go through and fall back on. If you want to go through any of the stuff that I went through and covered today, that uh, acm.re link, you can go to that link and you can grab a copy of all the bro log files that were here uh, that I went through when I used. We'll also make the slides available. There'll be a video available for this on YouTube within about a week or so. Uh, so basically everything you need to go through and kind of try and reproduce this for yourself. If you're trying to build internal processes, it's a good way to go through and say, here's a known data set. I should be able to, you know, whatever process I want to use to check my own stuff, let me check it against this stuff first, because I know what's there, I know what I should be seeing. And if I'm seeing that as well, great. If I'm not seeing that, okay, I need to go in and tweak my processes. Yeah, and that'd be it. that be it. Oh, yes, and the link for Rita. So you got the link for Rita there as well. And at that point, let me take some questions. Uh, let's see. For Chris, there's one here from Jerome. Is there a way to detect the command being sent 
by the attacker. Okay, so the question, yeah, oh, actually, yeah, sorry. I'm used to presenting live, I'm used to repeating every question, but no, everybody heard that. So the actual command itself, it, it, so it, again, it depends. Normally, no. So when you think about, I wanna monitor every packet that's going by, and I wanna be able to have a large data set, like 24 hours or more, in order to be able to catch, you know, let's say slow beacons that have a lot of jitter built in, built, built into them, trying to keep full PCAPs is hard in that type of situation. So we tend to kind of strip them down, like I was showing with Bro, you know, keep the minimal information we need to go through and do this. If I go through and I figure out, okay, I've got a, I've got a backdoor, you know, here's a command and control channel, and here's where it was activated. I may not have a payload to work with to be able to go look at to see what was that command set. Even if I do, it may be obfuscated or encrypted. Most of the time, these things are encrypted to be able to figure out, so what was that command? Now, one of the things you can do, however, is you can usually enumerate a little bit about what's going on within the session sizes that are taking place. So imagine I see it's a beacon, you know, it's sitting there, it's beaconing, it's beaconing, and then one of the times it calls home, that causes... I don't know, 100 megabytes to get transferred from the local system up to the system, you know, up to the, out to the system on the internet. So what happened? Okay, I, I didn't see what control took place, but somebody just grabbed 100 megs worth of files. It shouldn't be too hard to go to that system and say, hey, if I catalog all my Excel spreadsheets and all my Word documents that are on here, and then add those two numbers together, I'm probably going to come up with about 100 megabit. In other words, to see 100 megabits leave, that's a pretty clear indication to me that the command and control channel said start grabbing local files. The most interesting are usually, you know, business related documents. If I see it go the other way, if I see it call home and I see a big data transfer take place from the external system with data pushed down towards the internal system, okay, that might be additional tools, an additional backdoor. They may have just pushed down an additional toolkit. They may want to have a second rootkit on the box. So if you catch the first one, they still remain to in control of the system. They may push down additional tools to try and start moving laterally to be able to go after other internal systems. So even though I can't see the command, just based on the amount of session data taking place, I can usually make some pretty good educated guesses on what actually was in that command set. Cool. What else we got for questions, Bill? Uh, got a couple of thank yous. Um, Happy and to. Uh, and uh, both Jason and I were answering questions during the course of the presentation. Uh, well, here's one. What's keeping you, us, from doing a multi-dimensional statistical analysis? Whoa. Packet size versus uh, packets, packets it, pa basically comparing packet sizes and then the time between the sessions? So nothing. Part of Rita and a Hunter, that's actually something that's being done. We are looking at, you know, multiple criteria to go through and kind of identify, you know, session, session size and packet size. Now, whether it's, whether it's in the same array being processed at the same time, I'll be honest, there, there's much smarter people than myself that work the back end that would know how we actually kind of lay it out in code. And actually, read is open source, so that, that code is there. And like I said, we have patents on this, so you can always go read one of the patents. That'll kind of define out what the process is we're using as well. But uh, absolutely, you can go through and you can do that. And, and that's something we actually do go through and do. Hey, Chris, we had a, a question that was answered, but I wanted to get you to answer it to everybody. Since the numbers you're showing are interesting, is it normal for C2 to go back so often, multiple times per minute? What other intervals would be considered normal for C2? So it depends on who you're trying to catch. Are you trying to catch a red teamer or are you trying to catch a bad guy? because those, that's one of the other distinctive patterns we've noticed as well. Red teamers are much quieter than bad guys. And I, and I can kind of walk you through this. Is it's pretty easy to kind of understand why. When you think about a red teamer, you, know, you're, you have, a, you have uh, two focuses of your job, break in and go undetected, and that's it. So you're going to put a lot of effort into what exploits am I using to gain control of the system, and you're going to put a lot of effort into how covert can I make, make my backdoor channel to make sure somebody doesn't catch that. So as far as like, you know, beaconing home, something like once per minute, once every 10 minutes is more common when it's a red teamer. If, however, it's a bad guy, 
God, we've seen some that are like three times a second. They, they tend to be very noisy. And the reason for that is, as a bad guy, I have many different problems I'm trying to solve. You know, the red teamer is almost a little bit like the underwear gnomes. They break in, they set up that covert communication channel, accounting does something they don't know what, and then a paycheck shows up. So they can focus on those two things and money shows up to them. For, for a bad guy's perspective, it's totally different. They need a business model <laughs> to kind of work around. How am I going to get, how am I going to make money off of this? You know, am I going to encrypt the person's drive and try and hold it as, as extortion? You know, am I going to go through and steal files and threaten to give them away if they don't, you know, pay me money? Am I going to just steal their CPU time and use that to try and go through and mine Bitcoins or, you know, some other sort of digital currency? That is usually the big problem I'm trying to solve as a bad guy. The covert communication channel is secondary to me. Again, put yourself in the, in the seat of an attacker. When you think of this as an attacker, your focus is on what's my inhibitor to making a profit? Well, we haven't gotten good enough at catching command and control yet. The industry average is still, I mean, based on you know, data over just like the last 30 days, we're still like 190 days to detection. And even that number, quite honestly, is misleading because usually when, you when someone finds out they've been compromised over half the time, uh, they find out they've been compromised through a third party, usually it's law enforcement. And you know, I keep picking on them, but it's a good example, uh, Citrix. You know, Citrix found out in, G in January when law enforcement went to them and said, hey, so we found a terabyte of data that we think is yours, and it was probably stolen off your network. And that was the first indication they had that they had been backdoored. So they didn't detect the backdoor command and control channel. They didn't find the bad guys on the network. They learned about the after effects from a third party. So that, you know, 190 plus days to respond uh, that is still an industry problem, and it's one of the things we're focused on trying to solve, but you know, not everybody's solved it yet. So is it, for, again, from the perspective of a bad guy, until, that, until I'm losing control of my systems faster than 190 days, that's plenty of time for me to monetize it. Until that number drops by down to something insignificant, I've got bigger problems to solve in my business model, like how am I going to make money off of this? So they're going to stay focused on that. So I know that was a really long answer, but to kind of summarize it and bring it back to the original question, when it's actual malware, yes, it tends to be very noisy. You know, like once per second is, is I'd say, probably pretty close to an average. When it's red teamers, when it's people getting paid to do this as testing, they tend to be quieter, more patient, inject more jitter, you know, all sorts of fun stuff like that. Chris, another question here asking about attempts to fool Rita or AI Hunter by padding the content to make it look more legitimate. So you can try, so you can try it. And if it works, oh my God, let's talk. Because that is actually one of the things that we go in and look for. So we talked about jitter. You know, we talked about how jitter is that, you know, beacon once per minute, plus or minus 50%. So now my beacon is going off at 30 seconds or 90 seconds. You can do similar with the padding. You can go in and you can say, add some random amount of padding between zero and some value. When you analyze it, it's almost like half of that jitter time. You know, in other words, the, the math you use to tag something when it's doing jitter is actually pretty close to when somebody's actually going in and doing padding. There's also limits on how much padding you can do, meaning that if you're thinking, well, I'll just make it a big number. I will, you know, pad anywhere from, you know, zero to, you know, 10 gigabit uh, or 10 gigabytes. Well, yeah, you could do that. But now if you're padding 10 gigabytes, you've now become the top talker on the network the net admins are gonna catch you. You don't need the security people to catch you. So you're kind of limited in how much padding you can put in there. But from an analysis perspective, yeah, it's basically like half a t jittering the timing to be able to go through and try and catch it that way. Does GCAT send a mail client agent string in the traffic? It does. It actually looks, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny because when you look at like, where did this come from? You can find, many different forums talking about, hey, I, I need to be able to uh, set up a process that checks mail to solve this technical problem. I wanna write it in Python. Here's what I've got for code. Here's what I'm seeing for errors. Can anybody kind of help me out? 
So this really kind of looks like this was out there as a solution to solve other problems and then kind of got adopted as part of this. So yeah, it, it's, it looks like a regular email client. Now, how it identifies itself, I mean, that, that's a text string you can go in and you can change in the code. Don is asking if you are going to be at San San Diego West. I am not. My next trip to San Diego is for the Cisco conference in June. And I'll be doing some presos there. All right. So, uh, Chris, any final thoughts, final words for the audience? Yeah, just if uh, if the you do come up with any more questions, hit us up on Twitter. If you figure out how to break things, oh my God, let's talk. <laughs> you know, again, hit us up on Twitter. I know a lot of vendors get really sad when their stuff gets broken and like to threaten lawsuits and all sorts of nasty stuff like that. That that's just not us. We actually we actually had someone come up with a way to kind of covertly avoid our long connection detection that I just thought was brilliant I and mean, actually absolutely loved it. So yeah, if you, if you break our stuff, oh my God, let's talk. That, that's just cool. We'll like send you Amazon gift cards or something. We'll, we'll figure out some way to say thank you for that. <laughs> we got cool t-shirts. We'll send you lots of cool t-shirts too. All right, everybody. Uh, look for the recording on our YouTube. We always have that available. So if you haven't found our YouTube, uh, feel free to do a search for active countermeasures and then, uh, We'll look forward to see you on the next Black Hills Information Security webcast or the Active Calendars webcast. Thank you all very much for being here. Have a good day. Hey, thank you, folks. Thank you. Yeah, we had a thousand people in the webcast last week, and John started talking about some things that uh, no one should ever Google. And <laughs> <laughs> I had people come up uh, at b Side Charm over the weekend, and he's like, I never knew what that was, and I Googled it. And I was like, why'd you Google it?